On September 12, 2025, the universe blinked. It started as a faint streak on a telescope feed, a moving point of light so bright it saturated the detectors at the Cerro Paranal Observatory in Chile. Within hours, observatories across the world confirmed it, an object of colossal luminosity entering the inner solar system from the darkness of interstellar space. Its name would soon dominate every scientific forum and news network, C2025R2, or simply, SWAN. At first, astronomers thought they were watching another long-period comet, an icy remnant from the far reaches of the Uit cloud. But the readings were wrong. The reflectivity was far too high. The tail stretched across five full lunar diameters, bright enough to be visible even through city light pollution. And as more telescopes locked on, something else became clear. This was not behaving like any comet ever recorded. Spectral analysis revealed metallic peaks, strong reflections from nickel, cobalt, and chromium, the same combination used in aerospace-grade alloys for heat resistance. No known comet contains that mixture. The data suggested not dust, not ice, but structure, solid, coherent, reflective in a way that implied design. Then came the shock that froze every observatory on Earth. Swan was not alone. From the opposite side of the sky, another visitor was on approach. Smaller, dimmer, but already infamous 3I Atlas, the third confirmed interstellar object after Aumuamua and Borisov. Both bodies, arriving from completely different sectors of the galaxy, were now on inbound trajectories that would bring them into the same orbital corridor near the Sun. Their perihelia, the points of closest solar approach, would occur within three days of each other. Two interstellar anomalies entering our system in synchronized motion. The odds of this happening by chance are astronomically small, on the order of one in a hundred million. And yet, it was happening. NASA's JPL analysts ran orbital simulations. The vectors matched in a way that couldn't be explained by random galactic drift. Swan approached from Aquarius, Atlas from Sagittarius, two directions separated by 90 degrees, yet both bent toward the same corridor, intersecting the inner solar system almost simultaneously. It was as if two ships had been scheduled to arrive at the same port, under the same gravitational clock. For weeks, the data dominated every astrophysics channel. The object was enormous. Estimates placed Swan's nucleus at over 30 kilometers across, far larger than typical comets. Its albedo, a measure of reflectivity, was nearly triple that of natural ice, suggesting either an unusually metallic composition or an active surface mechanism maintaining reflectivity against the sun's heat. As it drew closer, its behavior became even stranger. Instead of fragmenting or shedding material, Swan maintained its structure, while the tail began to pulse. Every 43 seconds, a rhythmic surge of light swept across it, detectable not only in visible wavelengths but also in the ultraviolet and radio spectrum. It was as if the tail itself was breathing, contracting and releasing energy in perfect synchrony. In laboratories across the world, researchers began calculating the energy required to produce those pulses. The numbers were staggering, outputs exceeding 10,000 gigawatts, more than the entire electrical consumption of the human race. No natural sublimation process could account for that. And then came the blackout. From October 8th to the 18th, both Swan and Atlas passed behind the sun from Earth's perspective, entering what astronomers call a solar conjunction, a period where observation is impossible due to the sun's glare. But this time, the silence felt deliberate. Data streams from NASA, ESA, and ISRO telescopes abruptly went offline. The solar orbiter's feed was restricted. Soho's images skipped entire intervals. Even amateur astronomers who had been tracking both objects found that online databases were suddenly delayed or missing entries. When visibility returned, Swan had brightened by nearly a full magnitude, and Atlas, once greenish-white, now glowed a deep, electric blue. Something had happened near the sun, something no one had been allowed to witness. In press conferences, NASA spokespeople called it a routine conjunction blackout. But behind closed doors, independent astronomers whispered a different theory, that the objects had interacted. Orbital models showed that during conjunction, the two bodies had come within less than 50 million kilometers of each other. 
the smallest separation between any two interstellar objects ever recorded, the probability of such proximity, with synchronized timing and mirrored approach angles, is effectively zero. Yet it occurred, perfectly aligned with the ten days when Earth could not observe them. For those who have studied deep space dynamics their entire lives, randomness no longer felt like an answer. When Swan re-emerged from solar glare, new data from the James Webb Telescope revealed something extraordinary. The spectrum contained narrowband emissions, structured, coherent, and non-thermal. Not reflections, but signals. Emissions near soft X-ray and gamma frequencies, in precise intervals that repeated with near mathematical perfection. Around the same time, radio observatories detected low-frequency modulations echoing those same intervals, 43 seconds, originating from the direction of Swan. The signal was not directed at Earth, but toward the Moon. The transmission targeted a region near the South Pole, an area known for its gravitational mascons, dense anomalies deep beneath the lunar crust that have baffled geophysicists for decades. What could an interstellar object possibly be signaling toward the Moon? When analysts mapped the signal vectors, they found they intersected perfectly with an ancient crater chain stretching across the lunar south, near the Shackleton region, a site suspected of containing metallic deposits and high concentrations of helium-3. To most, it was coincidence. To others, it looked like a handshake, a message between two systems we were never meant to hear. Then came the disturbances. Across Earth, magnetometers began to register synchronized pulses matching Swan's rhythm. Seismographs in South America and Antarctica picked up ultra-low frequency vibrations that could not be traced to tectonic movement. Even migratory animals, whales, birds, and bees began to deviate from their seasonal paths, as though responding to a signal no human could hear. The phenomenon was global. Every 43 seconds, a pulse rippled invisibly through the magnetosphere, faint but persistent an echo of something vast moving beyond our atmosphere. At Harvard, astrophysicist Avi Loeb, head of the Galileo Project, publicly warned that the data surrounding both SWAN and 3I Atlas could not be dismissed. Loeb, already known for proposing that Aumuamua might have been artificial, called for the release of all raw imagery from NASA's solar orbiter and SOHO missions. We cannot afford to filter our interpretation through what we wish to be true, he said, if the data contradict our models, we must expand our models. But the images never came. Multiple insiders leaked that NASA's image processing teams had been reassigned. Requests for release were under review. The justification, potential misinterpretation risk. When the government reopened after the October data freeze, nothing new was published. In the absence of transparency, private researchers stepped in the Abel Tracker Collective in Spain, the Southern Skis Network in Chile, and the Citizen Astronomers Guild in Australia pooled their instruments to reconstruct Swan's trajectory independently. What they found shook even the skeptics. Swan's trajectory was subtly changing, not in a random drift, but in a controlled pattern, as if performing microcorrections to maintain alignment with Atlas. Each shift coincided with a corresponding brightness change in Atlas, suggesting communication or synchronization. By late November, scientists began referring to the pair not as separate entities, but as a dual system. In orbital dynamics terms, they behaved like two bodies sharing a guidance network, one massive and slow, one smaller and maneuverable. Some theorized that Atlas acted as a scout, mapping gravitational conditions ahead of Swan's passage, transmitting data through the very emissions now detected across the electromagnetic spectrum. Others went further, speculating that what we were witnessing wasn't just an interstellar passage, but a rendezvous. As researchers dug deeper, an unsettling historical pattern began to emerge. The calculated orbital period of Swan, around 22,500 years, aligned almost perfectly with the end of the last ice age, roughly 22,000 years ago. Archaeologists revisited the world's oldest known temple complex, Gerbekli Tepe, in Turkey. Its stone pillars bear carvings of celestial bodies, twin orbs and radiating tails, imagery some have interpreted as ancient depictions of comets. One pillar, Vulture Stone, 
encodes a star map matching the sky around 10,950 BCE. The same epic swan would have last passed near Earth. Could our ancestors have witnessed this same spectacle, a glowing fortress crossing the heavens, and recorded it in myth? If so, swan's reappearance is not random. It's cyclical, predictable, and perhaps intentional. Meanwhile, whispers of classified missions surfaced. A small probe, unnamed, unacknowledged, was reportedly launched from a private orbital platform during the blackout period. Its objective, to approach SWAN and perform spectroscopic scans at close range. The probe's signal vanished at a distance of 1.1 million kilometers. The final transmission was a distorted image, a reflection of itself, mirrored back, followed by total radio silence. Engineers described it as an energy wall, a structured electromagnetic field resembling a Faraday lattice, capable of absorbing or deflecting incoming radiation. If confirmed, that would mean SWAN is not just a passive object, it's aware. Then something stranger. During SWAN's brightest pulse, both Voyager spacecraft at 20 billion kilometers from Earth simultaneously transmitted brief, unscheduled data bursts. They were identical, structured, and undeciphered. Analysts believe they were triggered automatically by an external signal. Some see it as coincidence. Others see coordination. By December, the narrative was shifting from curiosity to caution. NASA's Deep Space Network issued temporary bandwidth restrictions for frequencies overlapping SWAN's emissions. ESA's Solar Orbiter team postponed their data release indefinitely. In official statements, they cited instrument calibration. But in internal memos leaked weeks later, the language was clear. Do not amplify signal anomalies associated with C2025R2. Refrain from speculative interpretation. The blackout had become policy. As the agencies grew silent, the independent networks grew louder. Through encrypted channels, citizen scientists compared magnetometer readings, plotted pulse intervals, and reconstructed emission spectrograms from fragments of public radio data. What they found was unmistakable. A pattern of harmonic ratios, 3, 2, 5, 3, 9, 4, precise mathematical relationships that don't occur naturally in thermal processes. It was rhythm structured like code. Suddenly, the fortress, nickname didn't sound like metaphor. And in the background of it all, 3i Atlas continued to pulse smaller, fainter, but in sync. Its blue spectral emissions intensified, matching Swan's intervals perfectly. Two anomalies, thousands of kilometers apart, speaking the same language across the void. Then came the most unsettling revelation yet. Spectroscopic data from Webb showed that Swan's outer halo contained not random dust, but organized organic molecules, complex hydrocarbons aligned in structured chains, repeating in identical orientation over vast distances. These are not chaotic prebiotic mixes. They're engineered, polyaromatic hydrocarbons, the building blocks of life, but arranged in uniform crystalline arrays. To biochemists, that looks less like nature and more like purpose, the signature of a carrier. It raised a terrifying possibility. What if Swan isn't just a vessel, but a seed ship? A carrier of biological material designed to distribute life across galaxies. A mechanism for panspermia, but built, not born. If that's true, then 3i Atlas might not be random either. It could be an autonomous scout collecting data, confirming planetary conditions, transmitting confirmation signals back to the fortress that follows. A lock and a key a drone and a mothership. This interpretation explains almost everything. The synchronized arrivals, the rhythmic pulses, the controlled energy output, the blackout window when both vanished near the sun. The only thing it doesn't explain is why now. Why, after millions of years of quiet, would such a system appear exactly when humanity has developed the instruments capable of seeing it? Perhaps that's the point. The physicist John Wheeler once said, no phenomenon is a real phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon. Observation itself changes the universe. Maybe that's what happened here. The moment we became capable of perceiving them, they became active. Awareness triggered response. By early 2026, Swan began to fade, retreating beyond the orbit of Mars. Its brightness diminished, but its rhythm never stopped. The 43-second pulse continued weaker but measurable. As it moved outward, Earth's magnetic field stabilized, 
animal migrations normalized. Seismic anomalies ceased, but one thing did not stop. Every 43 seconds, the voyagers, both of them, transmitted faint echoes. A heartbeat across the void. The deeper you look, the clearer it becomes. Swan and Three Eye Atlas are not cosmic accidents. They are a system designed, deliberate, patient. And we have only just now become aware of it. The sun, once seen as the heart of our solar system, may not be just a gravitational center. It might be a meeting point, an interstellar relay, a station in a network far older than we can imagine. If that's true, then the question isn't whether humanity will make contact. The question is whether we already have and whether the signal wasn't something we received, but something we sent simply by watching. Because sometimes, the act of observation is itself the trigger. And maybe, just maybe, the cosmos has finally begun to answer back.